Hi, I'm uh, Ben Montgomery uh, coming to you from Tampa, Florida. Um, just returned from Appalachia, in fact. Uh, last week I was in the uh, foothills in North Carolina fly fishing on um, Little Snowbird Mountain not far from the AT. Um, I'll set this up just a little bit. This is an essay I wrote uh, for the summer fall 2019 edition of Appalachia Journal uh, for the AMC. Um, it was uh, what I thought was, uh, go, go, as I was going through one of the harder periods of my life, um, uh, this all kind of came pouring out of me. And I was happy to have, uh, have this essay as a vehicle to express some of the, some of the deep emotion that I was feeling. Um, as it turns out, um, that emotion has been uh, coupled recently with uh, the unexpected death of, of my 11-year-old son, uh, Bay, who's mentioned in this story, um, uh, his mother and I are still trying to uh, figure things out and um, learn something about what it's like to um, exist in a new world that neither of us are used to, neither of us want to be involved in, but um, it is what it is and we carry on. Um, so I'll just let the essay uh, uh, speak for itself. Uh, the title is A.T. Redemption, A Father at a, at a Crossroads Takes His Kids Hiking, 244 Miles. The fight broke out on a narrow ridge somewhere high above Davenport Gap, and I'm only slightly embarrassed to admit that my first thought in my head was that this was the most beautiful location in which I'd witnessed hand-to-hand -hand combat. Embarrassing because fighting before me were the fruit of my loins, the youngest and oldest, nine and 14, tangled up in ground warfare on the Appalachian Trail, flanked on both sides of this mile high ridge by perilous drop-offs. Asher, the elder, struggled atop Bay. She'd somehow used her walking stick to pin Bay's shoulders to the mountain, and he'd managed to grab two fistfuls of her long brown hair, and the tangle amounted to what would be considered a stalemate in ultimate fighting. A better parent might have intervened, I kept my distance. They both shot long looks in my direction as if to say, aren't you going to stop us, daddy? I did not. This was their fight and it had been brewing for miles. My middle child, Morrissey, 12, looked up at me with a smile that said she approved of my inaction and that she rather enjoyed the break in walking. We both watched in silence as the other two wrestled in the glorious wild. When Asher was finally able to pry her brother's hands from her hair, she shoved herself off him and stomped him in the crotch. He wailed. I moved in to help him up. I've come to believe that a long hike has a biological cycle. Like almost everything, life, relationships, civilizations, songs, stories, stars, it is born in explosive uncertainty. It grows more comfortable adapting and striving. It reaches a climactic, epiphanic moment when great lessons are learned, and it gradually begins its scent toward descent toward finality and death. Belden Lane, in his book, Backpacking with the Saints, compares a certain kind of hike to a death lodge, a sort of symbolic place to which the wanderer retires to say goodbye to his old life. A death lodge is a place for acknowledging that a chapter in one's life is closing, Lane writes with a new one beginning to open. Maybe this hike was our death lodge. In any event, day five for the Montgomery's was adolescence. I would later learn through some tiresome post-fight analysis because if anything is in surplus on a long AT hike, it's the time you have for conversation, that Bay had caught a short burst of energy and tried to pass Asher on the trail. And Asher had somehow whacked Bay's leg with her stick. And Bay had tried to take Asher's stick before they both fell to the ground. The details matter more to the loser, of course, to the party who, can't, who can hold tight to injustice and long for retribution. And maybe that explains why I'm writing. Why do we hike? The easy answer, the one I tried out before crowds of ladies who come to libraries and senior centers to hear me talk about my first book, Grandma Gatewood's Walk. We have relied on bipedal locomotion for six million years, and only in the past hundred or so have we chosen in great numbers to sit and ride rather than strike out on foot. Early man walked 20 miles a day. 
Benefits were attributed to walking as far back as ancient times. Pliny the Elder described walking as one of the medicines of the will. Hippocrates called walking man's best medicine and prescribed walks to treat a variety of afflictions. Aristotle lectured while walking. Leonardo da Vinci designed raised streets to protect walkers from cart traffic. Johann Sebastian Bach walked 200 miles to hear a master play the organ. William Wordsworth is said to have walked 180,000 miles in his lifetime. Charles Dickens took crazy nighttime walks and once said, the sum of the whole is this, walk and be happy, walk and be healthy. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote of the great fellowship of the open road and the brief but priceless meetings which only trampers know. Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche said, only those thoughts that come by walking have any value. Henry David Thoreau waxed forever about walking. I can easily walk five, 10, 15, 20, and any number of miles, he wrote. We moderns, confined to the roads in our man traps, as Thoreau presciently called cars, have lost hold of something powerful. And we hike to try to get that back. That's the easy answer, and it's mostly true. It's more complicated, uh, uh, the more complicated and personal answer then. Divorce is terrible. I do not wish it on my worst enemy. Divorce is, as the great Pat Conroy wrote in Atlanta Magazine in 1978, a lurid duet that entices observers to the dance and brings down a small civilization of friends, children, relatives. Two people declare war on each other and their screams and tears and days of withdrawal infect their entire world with the bacilli of their pain, he wrote. There are no clean divorces. Divorces should be conducted in arbitrage, surgical wards, blood banks, or funeral homes. The greatest fury comes from the wound where love once issued forth. For most of my marriage, I refused to even say the repugnant word. It came up often in deep late night conversation, but it was always broached in less offensive language. Would you be happier with someone else? Should we try something different? The end of my marriage was accompanied by a startling and unanswerable question. How can two people who have loved each other since they were teenagers, who made vows before their friends and families to always be together, who were miserable when deprived of each other's company, who brought three wondrous children into the world, who spent no small amount of time in the offices of marriage counselors with the goal of remaining together, how is it that in the void of a few months of trial separation, the love they once shared could morph into distrust, anger, hate, and finally, indifference? This was my lot as 2017 slammed into 2018, as I got sober and wrote out Hurricane Irma and lost my job at the newspaper and finished my third book, as lawyers were hired, finances untangled, and a 20th wedding anniversary went uncelebrated. I moved into a small apartment, bought a pull-out Ikea couch, and tried to make it feel like home. The kids arrived and departed with bags of their clothes. At the house, they had their own bedrooms, at my apartment, they each have a single drawer in their own, of their own in, in the dresser. We began to, to develop a routine though. We'd escape my apartment after dinner each evening and walk to a city park near downtown Tampa to lie in the grass and read, a round trip journey of a few miles. This simple exercise became salve for my heartache. We held hands and talked about our days as the sun set over the Hillsborough River. In their absence, I found myself longing for our walks. In the spring of 2018, I learned I'd landed a job teaching at the University of Montana for the fall semester. To make ends meet, to afford a mortgage and an apartment and child support and mounting legal bills, I'd have to move 2,600 miles away. I needed summer to be sustaining, and I felt the pull to spend it all doing something important with my kids. For the first time since college, I didn't have to report to a daily job. I started thinking about taking a long walk. About 274.5 miles of the Appalachian Trail separate Hot Springs, North Carolina, our starting point, and Springer Mountain, Georgia, the trail's southern terminus. And by the day of the fight, not far from Davenport Gap Shelter, just 36 miles in, everyone had cried but me. But we were still on our feet, and the trail seemed to be sending us some rewards. We started each day in a circle, packs on our backs, reading from the pocket Pima Chadron, and we meditated on the many lessons as we walked. Or maybe it was just me meditating. The kids seemed into it though. We, we can learn to rejoice in even the smallest blessings our life holds, 
It is easy to miss our own good fortune. Often happiness comes in ways we don't even notice. We watched the sunset on the grass-topped mountain called Max Patch, and we slept under the stars. We found a tiny turtle, no bigger than a half dollar, and paused for photos. We ate wild strawberries, one of the girls spotted along the trail. Every time we stopped to filter water, Bay took time to look for salamanders, and he began keeping count in his journal. The essence of life is that it's challenging. Bear activity in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park had forced rangers to close a few shelters, and that led to several high mile days. I pushed the kids hard and we put in 17 miles one day when I sensed morale plummeting. That's a long walk for a nine year old. In a moment of contrition, I promised that if they made it to Newfound Gap, 67 miles from Hot Springs, we'd try to catch a ride into Gatlinburg to resupply and we'd spend a night in a hotel. The way to dissolve our resistance to life is to meet it face to face. They humped like billy goats the next few days and seemed to find their trail legs. As day seven came and went, something started to change. They'd all three tell me later in private moments that this was the point of the hike when they began to realize I was serious, that daddy really was going to make them walk 274 miles to Springer Mountain and letting go of the idea that quitting was a possibility was its own sort of motivation. Above new Newfound Gap, an afternoon thunderstorm caught us by surprise and soaked us in our gear, but passed as quickly as it had blown in. As we descended from Icewater Spring Shelter, we began passing waves of doe-eyed day hikers, folks who had driven up to the gap and looked like they had randomly found themselves on the trail. You knew them by their panting and cleanliness. I felt the kids' pride swell as they practiced proper trail etiquette and stepped aside to let each new family go by, the clean children staring at my dirty offspring as they passed. We popped out of the woods and the gap was swarming with tourists on a bright summer afternoon. Without talking, we stripped off our wet shoes and socks and plumped down in the grass near the Rockefeller Memorial. We made it halfway through the Smokies and hovering in the air was some unspoken difference between us and everyone else at the gap. They had driven here, we had walked. I caught a woman taking our picture and smiled. Part of our deal, call it a bribe if you want, was that when we reached Gatlinburg, the kids could each pick out one item from the Nantahala Outdoor Center and I would buy it for them. I told them the item had to be reasonably priced and that it had to be useful on our journey. We hitched a ride into town and climbed the steps to the massive outfitter. Asher quickly picked a pair of lightweight sandals to wear around campsites in the evenings so her hiking shoes could dry. Morrissey, who'd been terribly disappointed in the bland dehydrated vegetables that made our evening meals, picked an assortment of prepackaged foodstuffs. Bay could not decide. Round and round he went for the better part of an hour, exploring pocket knives and camp pillows. When my patience wore thin, I suggested we take a break and come back later so he could make a selection after a good night's sleep. We rented a car and checked into a hotel near an indoor water park and ate mar mellow mushroom pizza and the difficulty of our long walk was briefly forgotten. We walked around Gatlinburg, a cauldron of American faux pari. In the historic district sits an honest to God store where you can rent one of those battery powered wheelchair scooter crossbreeds so you don't have to walk anywhere and it does brisk business. I know because I stood and watched men and women walk up to the shop, engage in a short transaction, then scoot away. I thought of Peter Steinhardt's story in Autobahn in 1987, when studies showed that Americans were spending four hours a day in front of their television sets. We experience life not through the soles of our feet, but through the seat of our pants, Steinhardt wrote. This is us now, soda in hand, butt planted on scooter, making the conscious choice to sit and ride down a sidewalk. Bay spotted a candy shop and dragged us all inside. He'd found his one item. I paid for a pound of assorted Jelly Belly jelly beans, whatever it takes to get him to walk. That night we went full Gatlinburg. We rode water slides and ate from vending machines and wound up somehow at the Hatfield and McCoy dinner feud, where I paid $56.95 per Montgomery so we could be treated like hillbilly royalty. No fewer than five birds lost their lives in the making of our table's bucket of fried chicken. 
We watch the actors sing and dance in some loose and farcical interpretation of the old Appalachian family feud. The Hatfields hated the McCoys. The McCoys hated the Hatfields. The families engaged in all sorts of ornery behavior to exact revenge for perceived slights. They bit and scratched and punched, and at one point, even engaged in a diving competition at a swimming hole to see which clan was better. It soon became clear that no one knew why they were fighting. The impetus for the bloodlust had been lost to time. Rage had filled the void of ignorance. This telling slowly narrowed in on the inciting events that had spawned untold decades of chicanery and vengeance. Only the oldest member of each clan knew what had started the war. Old grandpa on one side, dear granny on the other. In the climactic scene, we learned that years before, these two had been in love. And a simple mistake beyond their control, a misheard message, a missed rendezvous, set in motion a chain of events that led to decades of bullets and bloodshed. How easily love can sour, how devastating when it does. It was my turn to cry. We stopped to eat lunch at Clingman's Dome the next day, barely 200 miles from Springer Mountain, and watched another parade of tourists ascend a quarter mile paved sidewalk from the parking lot to the dome. We overheard a few, kids and adults, belly aching about how difficult the hike up had been. Quarter mile. One woman even stopped at the base rather than continue with her family up the spiral ramp to the tower to witness one of the best views in the Smokies. She'd had enough walking. Pima Chadrone would probably advise us to keep our judgment to a minimum, but we all smirked. The next flew, uh, few days flew by. We woke, we hiked, we ate, we hiked, we slept. We developed a routine in everything, in setting camp and cooking and filtering water and breaking camp. The kids assumed more and more responsibilities and I was glad for it. The complaining faded too, and we started to have fun. When we'd gone without food, without hot food for a spell, we would spend hours concocting the imaginary meals we would eat if we were home. Our conversations were often hilarious. We spent days, we spent hours playing would you rather, as in would you rather have muffin hands or corduroy skin? Would you rather fight 10 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? They rewarded us with mad scientist jelly bean combinations. Butter popcorn and Dr. Pepper was a night at the movies. Root beer and vanilla ice cream made a root beer float. On June 14th, we hiked from Siler's Bald Shelter to Molly's Ridge Shelter, almost 18 miles. We arrived just after dark, and the shelter was occupied by a group of seven women, already inside their bags and prepared to sleep. The kids and I activated our headlamps and quietly set about brushing our teeth and getting ready for bed. I told them to bring me their food and odiferous items so I could put them in our bear bag and run it up the cable. As soon as we slipped into our bags, a rodent, or maybe more, went to work, skittering back and forth across the wooden beams above us all night long. After a fitful and fragmented few hours of sleep, I woke up at dawn and discovered what our mouse friend had been up to. First, it had chewed a hole through Bay's L.L. Bean backpack. Then it had managed to drag the bag of jelly beans out and deplete my son's supply by roughly 80%. I woke the boy with a whisper. I'm sorry, buddy, I said, but a mouse ate all your jelly beans. His eyes filled with tears, but he didn't cry. You have to make sure we put stuff like that in the bear bag at night, I told him. Okay? He shook his head. Okay. Our shelter mates soon began to stir and dress and pack their bedding. One of them, a woman in her late twenties, began tugging on her hiking boots, then stopped, turned the boot over, and shook its contents into her hand. Eight colorful jelly beans. The next woman did the same, and the next. This mouse spent eight hours stealing jelly beans from Bay's backpack and dispersing the loot in hiking boots. I felt respect for the little guy, and maybe a tinge of sadness that we were ruining his dreams. The whole scenario felt familiar. I apologized yet again to a late riser who discovered the mother load in her shoes. Don't apologize, she said. I feel lucky, like he chose me. How many times in your life do you get to wake up and find jelly beans in your shoes? I'm not ashamed to admit that I cried when we popped out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The moment felt significant. We had walked 110 miles from Hot Springs and we were thriving. 
I was reminded of a line from a 150 year old Thoreau essay called Walking. I wish to speak a word for nature, he wrote, for absolute freedom and wildness, as contrasted with a freedom and culture merely civil, to regard man as an inhabitant of a part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society. We pressed on and the rewards of nature presented themselves to us. We saw a complete rainbow stretching over the mountains. We startled a rafter of wild turkeys and watched mule deer graze 10 yards from our shelter. We soaked our feet in every cold spring we could find. We woke one morning under a lean-to beam upon which someone had written, though the wind is fierce, it can't keep me from greeting the sun in the morning. We greeted the glorious sunrise atop a bald and ate our breakfast above the clouds. We passed mile marker 100 on Albert Mountain. My girlfriend Lorraine drove up from Tampa, met us, as close, to, met us close to the North Carolina Georgia line and drove us into Helen, Helen, Georgia, a charming little town. We did laundry, let the tent dry out and ate many bags of potato chips. We decided to jump about 30 miles of trail because the kids had to be back to their mother by the end of June. We started again at Hogpen Gap and a few miles from the parking lot, we saw our first bear. Lorraine tried to take credit. We'd hiked all this way without seeing a single bear and we see one on her first day. Her t-shirt made me, made me laugh out loud. Camping is intense, I-N-T-E-N-T-S. The adolescent cub hustled across the trail about 20 yards in front of Asher, who always led our hikes. He parked himself in some bushes by the trail and stuck his nose in the air. We clustered and took some photos of him and searched the area for his mother. We shouted ridiculous things in his direction, but nothing dislodged him, so we bushwhacked to the next switchback and hurried away. The rain struggled up Blood Mountain. We all did, but our mileage heretofore gave us an advantage. I got the sense that she didn't want the kids to know how exhausted she was. She wanted to impress them and they were feeling her out, trying to understand this new person their dad had feelings for. When it came time to decide our sleeping arrangements on Blood Mountain, my daughters were determined that I would sleep in the tent with them and Lorraine would take the smaller tent with Bay. Lorraine's plan was to join us for the last few days, catch a shuttle back to her car at Hogpen Gap, then give us a ride back to Tampa. Even now, our, our hike was taking on a new shape. We were slogging through an afternoon downpour about five miles north of Gooch Gap when I felt a sharp pain on my ankle. I slapped something off and kept walking. It felt like a sting at first, but a few miles later, I could feel the pain traveling up my left leg. Maybe a small snake had bitten me. Are there scorpions in North Georgia? I've been stung by a wide array of flying insects, but this pain was something else. I kept walking. Soon my anus started itching and then quickly that spread to my lower back. No amount of scratching brought relief. I dropped my pack to scratch my back. Something's wrong, I told Lorraine, who was hiking just in front of me. I pulled up my shirt and she examined my back. You're covered in hives, she said. Let's get to the shelter, I said. I continued to scratch myself for another mile or so when I felt heat in the lymph nodes on my neck. My ears started ringing. This may sound crazy, but if you ever wanna stand face to face with your own insignificance, if you wanna wrap your arms around your place in the wild, get yourself stung by some unknown insect in a downpour and feel your body flip out. We had no cell service and our path crossed no roads. I felt my lips swelling and my face going numb. I picked up the pace and caught up to Asher. I don't want you to panic, I told her, but I've been stung by something and my face is going numb and I've gotta get help. I told her I was gonna hurry the rest of the way to the shelter and asked her to take care of her siblings and Lorraine. She responded like we'd rehearsed for this moment a hundred times. Okay, daddy, she said. The Georgia woods became a wet blur. When I stepped into the shelter, which was occupied by a bunch of men and boys, I could barely speak. I managed to ask if anyone was a doctor. No. I explained what was happening to me and a man produced two Benadryl pills. I ate them, stripped out of my wet clothes and climbed into my bag. Hives covered my body. I tried to scratch my skin off until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning I was fine, as if nothing had happened. I would learn that when the kids arrived, they'd set about making camp and cooking themselves dinner like old pros. They hung their clothes out to dry. They hung their food in a bear bag. They took care of each other and Lorraine and me. We climbed Springer Mountain the next day and made it to the peak just as the sun set. 
All told, we'd hiked 244 miles together, averaging about 12 miles a day. We had tested ourselves against the earth, and we were better for it. Their smiles in the photographs made me giggle months later. We'd learned simple lessons on the trail, cliches all but meaningful, that you don't know what you can endure until you're forced to endure it, that it's okay to cry, that we are a family, fights and everything, that you have to protect the things you love or a mouse will steal your treasure and deposit it in a hiker's boots, that life is a struggle, that a long walk can be salve and maybe even salvation, that sometimes I'll need them to take care of me and that they'll be there.